He's pretty brilliant. Is it pleochroic? It's a color change, what? This is an Alexandrite? I thought I was seeing my hand through it. It's changing color, wow. I'm thinking of so many different things right now. We always had Christmas at my grandmother's. Christmas morning and I ran down the stairs and there was a brand new black electric guitar up on the stand. I rounded the corner and I just, I just hit the deck. I fell over, I was in shock. Are we doing Christmas stones or what's going on here? Gift stones? If you hop in a magical sleigh, you may see us on your way to Santa's workshop. If there's just reindeer parts in this box, I'm gonna be put off a little bit. Wait, what in the world? <laughs> <laughs> I can't even duck low enough to get the whole hat. Legend says it extends all the way to the North Pole. So we've got two different ruby specimens here. This one is ruby and parkasite, and then this one over here is ruby quartz, and you can see the little flashes. That's mica. This green one with the parkasite is from Greenland, and this guy is from Norway. And I think I sense a trend because those places are both very, very cold and very close to the North Pole. So Parkasite usually occurs in like a brown color, but it can occur in a brownish green and a dark green and even black, which is not what we have here. We have a nice little dark green one, which is uh, nicely Christmas colored, a little red and green action. It's about a five to six on the most hardness scale. I'm just loving the luster of it right now. It's some parts of it that are just really popping out against that ruby. So Parkasite, when it's nice and gemmy, can actually be extremely trichroic, which means it can show you up to three different colors, maybe shades of green, depending on which axis you view it from. So as you turn it, you can get a different color to sort of present itself. This one is opaque, so we're not gonna get any light through it, no matter what angle we view it from. Well, no, it's opaque. Corundum, which is what Ruby is, has a very high hardness, hardness of nine. One thing that that contributes to is just how lustrous it can be, even in its rough form like this. Because it's so hard, it can take a nice, high polish. So even rough ruby, if it's got faces like this one does, it's actually quite flashy. Told me I had to take the hat off. It's not Christmas yet. Movie magic, it's not Christmas yet. Now hold on a second. What do we got here? Oh, I got a flashlight as well. Whale? It is green, it's decidedly green. Oh wow, so this guy's got a strong Chatoyant effect to it. It's basically got microscopic inclusions in it that are aligned in such a way that make it so that when light hits from above, there's like this kind of glinting light that move back and forth across the surface of the stone. This is really cool. So if I had to guess, I would say that we've got chrome diopside, and I know that because chrome diopside can have chatoyancy. Once again, loopless, amateur hours. He's pretty brilliant. Is it pleochroic? It's a color change, what? This is an Alexandrite? I thought I was seeing my hand through it. It's changing color, wow. I, that is such a shocking color change. Okay, this is an Alexandrite. Alexandrite is famous for its color change property. So when it's lit with a cool light, like the lights that we have here on the set, it appears a nice green color. But if you hit it with a warm light, it immediately changes its color to uh, like a wine red sort of color. I honestly, I thought when I, <laughs> when I lit it up that I was seeing my finger through it. That's why it was turning a little pinkish. No, it's turning pinkish because it's Alexandrite. And to see one this large in person, I don't even wanna know how much this costs. You know what, I, I looked at it and it looked like it was a little bit included, which is on brand for Alexandrite, but wow, this is a fine, fine specimen. So Alexandrite, most of Alexandrite comes from Russia. It was discovered in the Ural Mountains and it's named after Tsar Alexander II. Actually, one of the first simulants for Alexandrite was synthetic color change sapphire, which was used as a simulant, I think as far back as like the late 1800s. It's just shocking and it's dramatic and it's not something that you see very often in the gemstone world, a gemstone that totally changes color depending on the temperature of light you expose it to. So a lot of Alexandrite that you find on the market is synthetic and because it's synthetic, we can kind of control the product that comes out, and so synthetic alexandrite can often have very dramatic color-changing properties. So both these guys are from Russia. Let's talk about chrome diopside. Here's the thing about <laughs> chrome diopside. It's found in Siberia, in one of the coldest places in the entire planet, and it's only really available during the summer months like six months out of the year, because the ground is literally frozen solid. There's only one commercially viable location. It's near the coldest major city in the entire world. It tends to not grow in sizes above like two carats. And the green color of it is extremely desirable. It's attractive. I don't know why it's not more expensive. To me, it's like a sleeper gemstone, because if you want that like 
emerald green color, but all the emeralds that you see in your price range or whatever are too included, check out chrome diopside. You won't be disappointed. Okay, box number three. Ooh. You guys need to have Rebecca on for this. This is one of her favorite stones ever. This is a tourmaline. One of the ways you can tell right off the bat, tourmaline has these long vertical parallel striations that run along its surface. That's one way to identify it. If I see that, I'm like, tourmaline is now on my checklist. And then if you look at it from the top down, you can see that it's sort of a, I kind of call it a rounded triangle. There's three sides, but they're not flat sides. They're, they're curved sides. Two points. Now tourmaline is high, high on my list. And this particular variety of tourmaline is called rubellite, and it is deeply purple. It's also highly included, so to the point where it's almost seems opaque in some places. It's one of the most desirable and sought after tourmaline varieties. It's the reddish, little bit of pink thrown in tourmaline. Rubellite gets this great color from manganese, trace amounts of manganese. So this particular specimen is from Russia, sticking with our cold theme, but you can find rubellite in places all over the world, like Brazil, Sri Lanka, all the usual suspects. It can also have liquid or gas inclusions on the inside, which is what I'm looking for right now. I don't see any. Absolutely fantastic specimen. Super glad to have this one today. Box numero cuatro. Ooh, wow, where were you during our metallic episode? All right, so we've got brookite, we've got magnesite, and um, looks like quartz with a little bit of anatase speckling it. Those are those black, highly lustrous as well. Little crystals sitting on our quartz there. Both of these guys are anatase on quartz and our brookite. Both come from Hardanger Vida in Norway, and I know I did not pronounce that correctly, <laughs> so I apologize. Norway's got a, a lot of natural beauty, lots of glaciers and mountains. It's a very cold climate up there uh, around Oslo. So anatase is a titanium dioxide, and it also forms quite often in bipyramid shapes. So a bipyramid is kind of exactly what it sounds like. Little four-sided pyramid on top, little four-sided pyramid on bottom. It requires 10 times the amount of titanium to create titanium dioxide as opposed to titanium metal. Speaking of titanium dioxide, that leads me to our friend brookite over here. It's also titanium dioxide, so chemically the same, and it's actually mined uh, in the same area as anatase, which makes sense because, you know, birds of a chemical feather often flock together. Some bad apples got the idea to falsify who they were, pretend they were, uh, more legitimate than they actually were, and went in in the area where these are mined and started destroying the surrounding area in an attempt to get specimens of this. So now it's quite heavily regulated. A few bad apples spoil the bunch, man. This is why we can't have fun. Brookite occurs in the orthorhombic crystal system, whereas anatase, on the other hand, occurs in the tetragonal crystal system, which explains why it's a little bit more orderly. They have the same chemical makeup, but they have totally different crystal structures. So polymorphs. Now, lastly, over here we have Magnesite. This guy is really small, but honestly, large, clear, well-formed crystals are pretty rare. On a first glance, it kind of looks like it could be a calcite, and it is a member of the calcite group. It forms in the trigonal crystal system, which means it's quite nice and orderly. Only about a three and a half or a four and a half, so it's pretty precarious to wear in jewelry. And not only that, to facet it and make it jewelryable is an ordeal in itself because it has perfect cleavage in three different directions, making it a lapidary nightmare. Cool stones from Norway. Last box, allegedly. Throwing me a curveball here, guys. I thought maybe this was rhodochrosite, but this is actually a gem called thulite. It gets its name from the word thul, which is what Norway used to be called. So this is actually a type of zoocyte. That may ring a bell. Tanzanite definitely should ring a bell. Tanzanite is the more famous variety of zoocyte, so it's really interesting that we have like a red zoocyte from a cold place and a blue zoocyte from a hot place out there in Tanzania. Although most tanzanite comes out of the ground looking kind of orange or brown and then it gets heat treated, but that's beside the point. Really attractive stone though. It's got lots of veining. It's not a solid red color. I've not met thulite in person before, but this is really neat. I wouldn't have thought that it was related to tanzanite in any way, but that's super cool. It's pretty thoroughly modeled. It's got streaks of white and gray. It's totally opaque. I'll hold up to the light just in case, but it's totally opaque. And for that reason, it's usually cut into cabochons or it's actually even used to, for small sculptures. You don't see a whole lot of it on the market though because supply is a little bit limited and people just don't know about it. And if there's no demand, then why would there be supply? Spread the good word about Thulite. I mean, it's really pretty. If you like pink or you like rosy, get into Thulite. 
Oh, we got one more I gotta close my eyes for? Oh yeah, super ready. I was born ready, so I ain't gotta get ready. What is this, half a skateboard? <laughs> I was not ready. Wow, Jade? <laughs> so this is polar jade, it's actually, it's very cold. There are two kinds of jade. I know I just said polar, but this it falls under one of them. So there's jadeite jade, and there's nephrite jade. This guy is nephrite, and it comes from British Columbia, Canada, where it's cold. Relative to the rest of the world, British Columbia is pretty close to the North Pole. Your nephrite jade is gonna have lots of, let me find some, a lot of little black inclusions, and lots of veining going throughout it. It's pretty translucent, actually. If I were brave enough to lift this up, you'd get a lot of light through it. In fact, if I take my flashlight and I shine it around the deck of this skateboard, you can see that a lot of light, in some places a lot of light passes through. You can totally tell where my flashlight is. But as I go into this more heavily included area to the right of the specimen, suddenly my light becomes a little bit more difficult to see. Jade is a great carving material for a number of reasons. One, well, it's gorgeous. But two, it's not very hard, but it is very tough. I think we mentioned in our first gem battle video that diamond beats jade in hardness, but jade beats diamond in toughness. So jade is found in a number of places around the world, but this stuff, polar jade, is specifically from the British Columbia region. We're coming up on the end of the episode, which means it's time to take a closer look. And today, I think it would be worth looking at Rubalite. Alright guys, that's the end of today's episode. Tell me, what is the coldest place you've ever been to? I lived in Ohio for a little while. It snowed on Easter. Um, <laughs> let me know down in the comments. And if you want to know more about all these gemstones that we saw today, Alexandrite, Rubalite, the Jade, Nephrite, even Jadeite, we didn't see it today, but if you want to learn about it, and any other gemstone you can think of, go visit our new website, gemstones.com, and tell us what you think. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and of course, ring the bell so you don't miss out on our future videos, and thank you for watching.